Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I um, uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak to this bill. And, and if, ever, if ever there is an issue that will be before this House that should not be politicized, this is it. Um, and I know that it's an issue that inflames um, passions and emotions and that that all comes from a very good place. Uh, but we, when we're talking about uh, children in, in care um, of, our, um, of our province, where the province has become the parent uh, on behalf uh, of all of us in our community, um, that is the most serious thing I think any of us will ever deal with, and it is something I know that everyone in this House on both sides uh, is a responsibility that we take very seriously. I, I also understand and, and get where emotion, passion comes from. At the same time, when we're talking about these issues, I would hope we wouldn't, we wouldn't heckle one another and talk over one another. And when we're talking specifically about what Bill 18 is and is not, I think it's equally important that we don't make this bill out to be more than what it is. It is a start. It is a small step on a very long road. Um, and I would like, in my comments here this morning, to frame it in that way, that it is not going to solve every problem. It shouldn't. It would be inappropriate for us at this stage of where the ministerial panel stands to suggest that it would. Um, it, it would also be, I, I think, naive to think that we could do such a thing uh, in this assembly, much as I know each of us would really like to, that what we see as a result uh, at the, a, in child intervention is the result of a very long line of intergenerational trauma, uh, of, of poverty, of addiction, much of that a result of residential schools. We need to understand how it is that we got to the place that we are now and why it is that we are grappling and struggling and perhaps, no not perhaps, not succeeding, flat out not succeeding and failing children in our society. And, and I want to be clear, that's not intended as a, as a shot at this particular government or certainly of the people who work in child intervention services or, or uh, uh, child and family services. Uh, or, uh, or uh, community and social services, or health, or education, or justice, or any of the any of the departments. The vast majority of people I know who work in those departments are tremendously dedicated people working in real in in, in 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 conditions and situations that I know I'm not brave enough to work in. I, I couldn't do it, but but yet uh, we we have people who do step up every single day and 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 who who do that. So. Is this bill perfect? It certainly isn't. Um, does it reflect the phase one recommendations of the child intervention panel? I'd say mostly it, it does. One of the things I've grappled with as a member of that child intervention panel as I learn more about this issue is, and I also think about my role on this side of the house as an opposition member, that the comments that, that we make in this house and the impact that that has on people working in the system and the contribution that we may make inadvertently I hope, inadvertently, that I hope comes from a good place, but that can contribute to a closed culture, a culture of fear, a reactive culture. Because when we're dealing with situations that are desperately critical, desperately sad, and just outright tragic, there are things that no matter how good the practice may have been, no matter how many safe landings there may have been, there may have been 500 safe landings uh, in a row, the thing we talk about is the 501st that didn't go well. Now that 501st shouldn't have happened. And, and I will talk about some concerns that I have with the bill and some of the things I hope to continue to see out of the panel because certainly things are not, uh, not perfect, not as good as they could or, or, or should be. So I, I want to be careful to, and very clear that I'm not excusing uh, uh, certain uh, ways of working. Um, but, you know, I'm grappling with the need to hold people accountable for mistakes and, and for bad practice. Of course we do. I don't think anyone would suggest that we don't. But how do we do that in a way that doesn't create or contribute to a culture of fear within child intervention services, child and family services, within Alberta's public service generally? So, 
I always have questions about the balance then between privacy and transparency. Transparency is a, is a very, um, uh, it's an important thing. It's what I think obviously that's what this, this chamber is about. Um, but I think it's important that we're clear on why it is that we as a panel have not been able to find consensus on the question of, uh, uh, of the publication ban. That some of the experts on our panel have argued quite forcefully that in fact we actually need to change or extend the publication ban. Based on the changes that were made, I believe, in 2014, um, coming out of the Fatal Care series, the changes that were made to the publication ban to, to allow for publication after, within four days of, of death of a child in care were well-intentioned and solved a problem we very clearly had. There was a frightening lack of transparency, and a lot of things got swept under the carpet that should not have been. That transparency, I believe, is absolutely important, but the discussion around the table has been, well, have we gone too far? What is the impact on communities? What is the impact on families? These are families dealing with the tragic loss of a child who need to decide within four days to make a court application. Is that fair or right? Is that appropriate? Are there better ways of doing that? That's the conversation that we're having around the table. So. To see that that has not been able to be resolved by the panel is frankly not a surprise to me. Now, I think that we have perhaps kicked the can down the road further than we might uh, like, but it is still an issue. I can assure you that I'm not going to drop that issue, uh, and, and I, I know the other panel members won't either. Um, so I'm not surprised to, to not see that in the bill. The question about fatality inquiries. Part of the challenge with fatality inquiries is how far in the future that they occur relative to the incident. So that unfortunately can do a couple of things. It can re-traumatize people who've gone through a very difficult situation. But the recommendations that we find, in fact, there was a uh, fatality inquiry conducted recently for an event that happened, an incident that happened 10 years ago. Well, without question, the practice that occurred 10 years in the past is no longer the practice today. Uh, the learnings that happen, happen very shortly after whatever it is that caused that particular incident. That isn't to say we should never have a fatality inquiry. Of, of, of course we should. It's not to say that we should never see uh, a name published. Uh, uh, we absolutely should. Um, but it, it doesn't uh, act in a timely way. So what I see in this bill are some initial steps to address some of those challenges. The year uh, uh, time frame I, I think absolutely is, uh, is an appropriate one. And, uh, and, and the, the, the resources required uh, to, to meet that, I think, are an open question, a very good question. And I recognize procedurally we can't address it in this bill. There's a, a process we'll need to go through. Um, I think the uh, OCYA has some very legitimate uh, questions that need answers. Uh, there are only seven investigators in his office. He's certainly going to need more than that if we're going to uh, achieve the, uh, the timelines that we strive for. Information sharing is uh, obviously an, a very, very important part of this bill uh, and something that this bill does not fully address but, but takes, takes some step uh, to, to, to do that. Um, you know, other, other questions I have is um, uh, having culturally relevant experts. Uh, I, I think that's a, a very important part of the bill and, and I'm, I'm very pleased to see it there. Um, but ban designated funding, which is substantially underfunded, the funding gap between services provided by uh, designated First Nation agencies, DFNAs, uh, on reserve, and what children off reserve receive is, 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 is not right. Um, some of those challenges are, fall into that jurisdictional morass of provincial and federal uh, funding, um, but, but children find they fall between the cracks of, of different bureaucracies, different jurisdictions, on reserve, off reserve, uh, and, and uh, you know, that's, that's one of those things I think all of us have a moral obligation to address. Um, and this bill won't, won't, won't address that, but nor, nor would I expect them to. Um, but, I, you know, in hearing from Indigenous peoples and DFNAs in particular, some of the stories of band councils having to supplement their budgets, they're very meager budgets. I'm just astounded at how small those budgets actually are. Some of, the, uh, some of that is, is provincial responsibility, but primarily it's federal. But that doesn't excuse inaction? Are there opportunities for us to, to invoke Jordan's principle and say, you know what, we're just, we're going to fund that. 
We're going to make sure that children are taken care of, that, that DFNAs have the resources they need, and then we'll go fight with the feds in the background. We'll just do, that's the complexity we're going to manage on behalf of children to ensure that they get the services they need, that we can start to move towards um, some, some better outcomes. Uh, that's, um, that's what we should be doing. And, and so, so I certainly will be supporting uh, Bill 18. Um, it, it's, um, it's a small step, and, and I would suggest, if I can offer some advice to the government not to, to, to trumpet this as, as some, uh, some massive move forward, uh, it, it's, it's a small step in response to what uh, we saw coming out of phase one um, uh, of, the, of the panel, but there is, it's an incremental step, and there is much, 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 much uh, more work to do. Um, I'm certainly committed to doing that, and I, I hope that all members of both the Child Intervention Panel, uh, but of the, uh, of, of the Assembly uh, are as well. And one of the areas, I think, where we really do need to do some work, and again, reflecting on my role in opposition and all of our roles here as elected officials, what are we doing to contribute to a positive culture within child intervention, recognizing that there are going to be times when things don't work out, and that when that happens, we should take that as a learning experience. There may be times where we do need to hold people accountable, where something uh, truly has been missed in a way that is negligent. Um, um, but I, I believe that those changes that need to occur are not so much on the front lines of the child intervention workers and the social workers and the remarkable people who work there. Um, perhaps there may be a case or two where that's not true, but I think in the vast, 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 vast majority of cases, those are the folks that are really um, doing what they need to do. And as we saw in our meeting last week, a lot of those people will push the envelope, will, will color outside the lines where necessary, will not just find themselves in, in a bureaucratic box because the situations they're dealing with don't lend themselves very well to bureaucratic boxes. Um, and there are some remarkable, remarkable people who do tremendous work and who are willing to go, well, I know this isn't the rule, but right now this is what's needed. So. If I get in trouble, I guess I get in trouble, but I've helped someone today. And how do we in the opposition react when someone's done that, but it doesn't go well? Well, what probably happens is that the question gets asked, and gets asked in question period, a news release is issued, and, and it's a great hue and cry. Well, they broke the rules and something bad happened. Well, what about all the other times when they went outside the rules or, or interpreted things in a way that allowed them to help someone that did go well? That's the kind of culture I think we need to be creating. I think we've also seen in the panel earlier on um, some cases where uh, some, some evidence of, 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 of a blocking culture where, where people uh, came before the panel and, and relatively senior were asked, well, what would you do? Well, I don't feel that's my place to say was the response. Well, what are you afraid of? What's, what are you, that, th that to me was evidence of a very closed culture, a culture of fear. And when you have people in an organization, especially higher up, who perpetuate a culture of fear, that's, that's not good. That's not the kind of um, a responsive system I think that we want to try to build. So Bill 18 is a start. It's a small step. It's a step in the right direction. It's not everything, nor should it be everything at this stage. What it tells us is that we have so much more work to do uh, and you certainly have, Mr. Speaker, my commitment to do that work. Thank you.